Dr. Maim Khan has had a very successful and fairly unusual career in that he served both as a senior bureaucrat, political agent in North Waziristan and Malakkan, as well as Home Secretary in the MW, of the MWFP, and senior diplomat, High Commissioner in India, Bangladesh, and the UK, as well as the Foreign Secretary of Pakistan. Dr. Maim Khan is a committed supporter of the peace process between Pakistan and India and has been working on track two talks between the countries for years. We are looking forward to his balanced analysis of where things stand today um, between the two countries and what the options are for us to move forward. Before I give him the floor, and on a more humorous note, Dr. Maim Khan has also had the singular distinction of having been fired as Foreign Secretary by both the democratic governments of Prime Ministers Nawaz Sharif and Benazir Bhutto. <laughs> we hope that this has not shaken his democratic beliefs. <laughs> I'm very privileged to be the first speaker to inaugurate uh, this uh, uh, new center for the arts and culture. I don't know exactly where I fit in. I'm not very good at music or dance. Uh, maybe stand-up comedy one day I will try it. But uh, you have uh, decided to start on a rather non-cultural subject. And a subject which uh, has been talked about so much that it's very difficult uh, to say anything new. Uh, nevertheless, uh, for those of us who have been personally involved, perhaps some of you might find some interest in whatever uh, personal angle uh, we can give uh, to this subject of India-Pakistan relations. When you come to think of it, there are a number of uh, what you might call, call scarlet threads running through the history of Pakistan uh, which have been responsible for many of the ills that this country suffers from. You could point out to uh, corruption, you could point out to provincialism, you could point out to extremism. And I submit to you that our relations with India is one of those scarlet threads which throughout our history has more often than not, not caused us more harm than good. Now, I don't say that the fault lies entirely with us and I hope during the course of my talk uh, uh, you will not think uh, that because I have served in India, uh, that I have been sold on the Indian point of view. Uh, but I approach Indian-Pakistan relations basically from the point of view that Pakistan should always try and do what is good for it, what is in, in its natural, in, in national interest, and not give preference to what is bad for India. Uh, India, uh, the India of Indira Gandhi uh, was certainly characterized by the desire uh, to be uh, the big uh, brother, the big boss of the subcontinent. Uh, and of course this culminated, as you know, in the tragedy of Bangladesh uh, and also in the intervention in Sri Lanka. I was in uh, Delhi when Mrs. Gandhi was assassinated. Uh, she herself did not like Janus uh, Yalak personally and she made that clear to me. She had a very poor opinion of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. She called him a liar and a fraud in her own company uh, because uh, he, she felt that he had deceived her at Simla. Uh, and she had this animus, I felt, towards Pakistan. When I went to pay my courtesy call on her uh, as ambassador, I was expecting the usual niceties of welcoming me to India and asking after my family and where I'd been and so on and so forth. She did nothing of the kind. The first thing she said to me in Urdu, Aapke aate hi hadsa ho gaya. There had been a hijacking within 10 days of my arrival. And you know, this, the tone of the interview, I could see, was icy and she had consciously done this. Now here I would like to say that uh, I find the Indian attitude uh, somewhat uh, ununderstandable. 
I want to maintain, you know, that India is a very big country with a small heart. I hate to say this. India does not, it may have the accoutrements of a potential global power. It may have the military might, it may have the economic might, it may have the land mass, it may have the uh, population, but it hasn't got the personality. This is, this is my reading uh, as an uh, uh, envoy to India for four years. There is a certain small-mindedness which characterizes Indian diplomacy, which from a large power dealing with a small power, you would expect a, a greater flexibility and greater generosity. This the Indians are never prepared to do. I suppose in a sense it's a compliment to us because they look upon us as equals. They don't want to make any concessions to us. But the fact of the matter is that uh, we may be equal in terms of sovereignty and independence and so on and so forth. But we are not equal in terms of military might and in terms of economics, etc. And we stand to gain enormously by cooperation in these fields. The result of this has been that our standing in Afghanistan, people pretend, I say, I use the word, they pretend that the Taliban are still Pakistan's boys and we should keep uh, favor with the Quetta Shura and all that because one day they are bound to come back uh, and then we will have what they call a friendly government in Pakistan. Now, now these are imponderables. I personally don't think that the hardline Taliban would be able to come back and rule Afghanistan on their own again. Uh, there will have to be adjustments between the Northern Alliance and the Pashtuns and various factions of the Pashtuns. The latest seems to be that there is, there are signs of a change of thinking in the security establishment of Pakistan. And I still maintain, I talk very frankly in a com company like this, and there is the media here, but I, 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 I talk very frankly. There is uh, some reason to believe that the shots are still being called uh, in Afghanistan and in our policy vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan and vis-a-vis -vis India are still being called, not uh, at the buildings on the hill, but here on and in Afghanistan and GHQ. And the, and the impression we get is that uh, General Kiani and the military and the uh, and the uh, security agencies are now coming round to the belief uh, that some kind of consensus, coalition, compromise will have to be necessary in post withdrawal of Afghanistan. <coughs> and therefore, we are getting ready to play a role as a sort of a mediator, would you call it, or an interlocutor, which will bring about a realistic understanding between the various political forces in Afghanistan. If this is true, to some extent, this is a good thing. But I hope to God that we do not come to believe that we are once again in a position to decide the future of Afghanistan. That we are once again uh, being supported in our uh, concepts and theories of strategic depth. Surely we have an interest, valid interest, legitimate interest in Afghanistan and we should play our role in diplomacy and in statesmanship and in negotiations to ensure what we profess happens, that is to say, a stable, independent Afghanistan. And once the Afghans decide uh, what they want, then we should make it a part of our policy to have good relations with that government. We should not try uh, to fashion and carve out governments to our liking in Afghanistan. Now, I'm very worried about this on another score, and that is that with this change and with the importance being given to Pakistan at the Ankara meeting and then at the London conference, that Pakistan is a key player in the negotiations and the interests <coughs> coming out of both. There is a certain euphoria uh, that we have managed to exclude India from Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Love you.